So, chemistry is the study of matter. And you've all had what matter is in bio or earth science. Matter takes up space and has mass, like this pen. It takes up space and has mass, that is matter. Now, matter is split up into two things. Substances, which means they have definite composition. So a substance that has definite composition would be an element, like this bar or cylinder of copper. If I take a sample of top, middle, and bottom of this cylinder, I'm going to find copper at the top, middle, and bottom. It is definite composition, okay? So what would fall under definite composition for substances? This would. Elements would be under definite composition or considered a substance, a pure substance. Another thing that has definite composition would be like salt, NaCl. So salt is a compound. And if you take a sample of top, middle, and bottom of a salt shaker, you're going to find NaCl. So the two things that have definite composition would be elements Elements and compounds have definite composition, okay? And if something has definite composition, which means if you take a sample of top, middle, and bottom, and they're all the same, it's considered homogeneous. So, a homogeneous substance would be an element or a compound, all right? And that's pure. These are pure substances. Now, on the other hand, we have a mixture of substances, which means we put elements together or elements and compounds together. And it says variable composition, which means if we take a sample of the top, middle, and bottom, it may not all be the same. So this is water, which is a compound, sand, which is a compound, but when we take a sample of top, middle, and bottom, it's not all the same. So this has variable composition, and this would be called a mixture. Now, mixtures can be in two forms. If there's a layer, which you see here, the mixture is considered heterogeneous. But if I put salt and water and stirred it up and took a sample of top, middle, and bottom, it would all be the same but it's still a mixture, but it's not heterogeneous. There's no layer. So it would be considered homogeneous mixture. So look what we have here. We have matter broken up into two things, into pure substances. Pure substances, always homogeneous and they are always definite composition and the only two things that have pure or definite composition would be elements and compounds. We'll go over them in just a minute. So we have substances on that side. We have mixtures of substances on this side. That means variable composition. They are not pure. Top, middle, and bottom are not the same. So mixture and the two types of mixtures are heterogeneous which means you look for a layer and they are kind of physically put together and we have homogeneous mixture okay we're first going to go over elements then compounds then mix so elements elements are substances 
And remember, substances are pure. So substance, element. Element is the simplest form of matter. It's homogeneous, which means it's pure. It has definite composition, which means if you take a sample of top, middle, and bottom, you're going to find the same thing. It can't be broken down any further. I don't care by physical or chemical means. It is the simplest form of matter. And this one is important. All atoms of the same element must contain the same number of protons. So, if we're talking about sodium, every atom of sodium has to have 11 protons. All right? So, whatever element it is, all the atoms got to have the same number of protons. So, diatomic gases, which we're going to talk about right now, are also considered elements. So what are the diatomic gases? Here's the way I like you to memorize them. No 17H. So what does no 17H stand for? Well, N2, O2, 17 is group 17, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, so that is N2O2, group 17, down to I2, and H2. H2. Now, these don't look like elements because there's two of them, but that's fine because it's the same thing. So all diatomic gases are considered elements. They're not considered compounds. They're not considered mixtures. So diatomic gases are elements. Okay? Models of elements. There's four models that we can do of an element. Simply, the easiest one is just a filled in circle like that. That could be an element. This also could be an element, an open circle. All right? Now, remember we just said the diatomic gases were elements, so two other models of elements could be two closed circles or two open circles. So element, 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 element. Those are the four models of elements. Now we come to the second type of substance. The second type of substance is compounds. So compounds is a substance. Remember, substance means it has definite composition. And if it has definite composition, it's homogeneous. Now, the most important thing I think about a compound is how they're put together and how they're taken apart. You just can't put two things together. So, how do you put together and take apart compounds? They have to be this. So the most important thing about compounds is how you put them together and how you can take them apart. So compounds must be chemically put together and chemically taken apart. You can't physically put them together. It won't make a compound. Okay, so once we do that, let's go to the next one, number five. So what we're going to do is we're going to put together Na and Cl. So we start out with Na. And over here is Cl. Now, you have to remember something. Na is never found in nature alone because it's so reactive. So if you had pure sodium and you put it in water, it would blow up. So sodium is explosive. Now, there's no such thing as just Cl. It's Cl2, and that's chlorine gas. And chlorine gas, if you smell it, Basically, you're going to die. So, sodium can kill you, chlorine can kill you. But, when I chemically put them together,
when I chemically put sodium and chlorine together, I get this. And that is salt. And I mean, it's not good for you, but you can eat salt. So the properties, what did the properties do? Sodium will kill you. Chlorine will kill you. When I chemically put them together, you get something that won't kill you. So the big deal about this is the properties of the elements that make up a compound compared to the properties of the compound itself are way different, totally different. And that's because we chemically put them together. So I'll write that down right now. So here it is written down. Very important rule for compounds. The properties of the elements that make up a compound, like sodium will kill you, chlorine will kill you, but if they're chemically put together, the properties of the compound itself are totally different because of the way they're put together. They're put together chemically. Okay? All right, that is number six. Number seven. A binary compound means two elements chemically put together. That's all. So like this. N-A-C-L. That's a binary compound and that was chemically put together. Remember, if you want to take it apart, you got to chemically take it apart. Okay? And binary compounds, when they're chemically put together, have a fixed ratio. which means you just can't put two things chemically together and get different ratios. So in other words, NaCl is a one-to-one -one ratio. Another one would be H2O. H2O means you always have two hydrogens with one oxygen. That's a fixed ratio, okay? CaCl2. Calcium chloride, fixed ratio, one calcium to two chlorines. So these are all compounds, and they're all binary compounds. And this fixed ratio has a definite name. If, it has a comp if it's a compound and has a fixed ratio, it has to abide by this law, the law of definite proportions. That means, like, if CA is connected to Cl, you got to have one calcium to two chlorines, all right? So that's the law of definite proportions. Now, uh, we're just going to go over four types of models for compounds. So the first type is the easiest. It's like NaCl. So we have Na can be a closed circle, Cl could be an open circle. So that's one type of compound, okay? Now, that could be, like I said, NaCl. Another type would be H2O, which would look like this. where O is the filled in circle and the two open circles are H. So that could be H2O. And then this one. So this one could be NH3, the N being the closed circle and the H is being the open one. All right. Now we have one more that we usually use in chemistry, and that's this one, CH4. So it would look like this. So these are the basic models for compounds. Open, closed, looks like that for water, ammonia, and CH4 would look like that. Now don't forget what we said earlier, if it's this, two open circles or two closed circles, 
That's not a compound. Definition of a compound, two different elements chemically put together. Two or more different elements chemically put together. This is a diatomic gas. That's not considered a compound. That is an element, and that is an element. You have to have two different elements chemically put together like that. Okay, so those are your models of compounds. So now we're into mixtures. Remember, on the other side, we had pure substances, definite proportions. So the pure substances, once again, that we went over already, elements and compounds. Now we go to the other side, and that's mixtures. Now watch this. Two or more substances, remember a substance is an element or a compound. Two or more substances physically put together. Where in a compound, it was chemically put together. Mixtures are physically put together. You pour two things together. So, definitely doesn't need any specific mass ratio and no definite proportions. So if you want to make a mud pie, it's not a certain amount of dirt to water. You just put some dirt in water, that's a mud pie. Or if you want to make salt water, no specific mass ratio. So salt water, so those are mixtures, two substances two or more actually physically put together. And the first one we're going to go over is called homogeneous mixtures. There's two types, homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. So the first So number 3, there are two types of mixtures. Okay? There's homogeneous mixtures and there's heterogeneous mixtures. So what we're going to do right now is we are going to go over homogeneous mixtures. That's going to be number one. So a homogeneous mixture, homogeneous means constant throughout. So if I have, let's just say, salt water, I put some salt in water, stir it up, and I take a sample of top, middle, and bottom, and it's all the same, that means it's constant throughout, that's a homogeneous mixture. I physically put the salt in the water, stirred it up, took a sample of top, middle, and bottom, it's all the same. So that's a homogeneous mixture. Another name for a homogeneous mixture is called a solution. And a solution is made of two parts, the solute. which it's like the salt in salt water. It gets dissolved. And the other part of a solution is the solvent. And the solvent does the dissolving. And there's two very good solvents. The best solvent is water. And the other solvent is alcohol. Now, there's many more, but these are the two main ones. So remember, a homogeneous mixture is called a solution. And solutions are made up of solute and solvent. Solute gets dissolved like the salt, and solvent does the dissolving like water. Water dissolves the salt. Okay? So that's solution. But there are many types of solutions, and we're going to go over them right now. So obviously, the example I just gave you, salt water, all right, that is a solution. So here's how you write it. Na plus Cl minus Aq. 
You don't have to worry about the plus and minuses yet because we just started chemistry. But the AQ stands for aqueous, which means you put the salt in water. So that right there is a solution. It's a salt water solution. Another solution is this, air. Air is a solution of gases. So the main gases in air are N2, about 70%, O2, about 25%, and then various other gases. And if you took a sample of the top, the middle, and the bottom of the column of air in this room, it would all be the same. So that means it's homogeneous. So air is a solution. It's a solution of gases. Okay? All right. So the next type of solution is this. This is brass. And brass is made up of two elements physically put together. So brass is copper and zinc. They melt copper, they melt zinc, they blend them together, and you get brass. So made from copper and zinc, Cu plus Zn. So this is a solution of metals. So we have a solid and liquid solution, salt water. We have a solution of gases, air. And now we have a solution of metals, brass. And the next solution is one of the most important. And this solution is made up of a whole bunch of liquids put together and this is called petroleum. Petroleum is made up of a solution of liquids and there's all sorts of liquids in petroleum. So here's just a few liquids that are in petroleum and I said there's a lot of them. Uh, gasoline, oil, butane, kerosene, aviation fuel, Asphalt, all that stuff is in petroleum. And uh, later on, we'll see how to get all those out of there. So now we have solutions. And one more thing about solutions, you can't filter them because they're all blended together. So You can't filter a solution, and the easiest one to think about is salt water. You can't filter salt water and get the salt out. Impossible, okay? So, that is homogeneous mixtures are called solutions, and I just gave you a bunch of solutions. Now, the next thing we're going to go over are heterogeneous mixtures. So, a heterogeneous mixture or a heteromix, you look for a layer. Just look for a layer, okay? So an easy heterogeneous mix would be sand and water. Salad dressing, oil and water, oil and vinegar, uh, dirt and water. If it has a layer, it's a heterogeneous mixture. Because if you take a sample of top, middle, and bottom, it's going to be different. It's not going to be uniform. And C, you can filter a heterogeneous mixture. You can filter it. Remember, you can't filter solutions which are homogeneous but you can filter heterogeneous mixtures. All right, now, the next thing we're gonna talk about 
would be properties of mixtures. So, properties of mixtures, the first property of a mixture, you physically put it together and physically take it apart. Not like compounds. Compounds you got to chemically put together and chemically take apart. But these, you can just pour together. And then if you want to take them apart, you can like filter them or do a couple other things that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. So, do not forget. This physically put together and physically taken apart is for both homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. But the number one most important property of a mixture is this. The properties of the substances that make up a mixture. Don't forget, substances are elements and compounds. So the properties of the substances that make up a mixture so let's just say uh, salt and water. Those are two substances. So the properties of the substances that make up a mixture and the properties of the mixture itself. So when I put salt in water, I get salt water. And so the properties are the same. Salt is salty, water is wet. When I put them together, I get wet, salty water. So. The properties for a mixture, when you put them together, are basically the same as the properties of the substances that were used to make the mixture. Okay? That's a biggie. That's a super important one. Letter B, mixtures don't need any specific mass ratios. You know, like H2O is water. That has to have a specific mass ratio. That's a compound. But salt water doesn't have to have a specific mass ratio. So, mixtures don't need specific mass ratios. So the next thing we're going to talk about is several ways how to take apart mixtures. So the first method to separate a mixture is if it's a heterogeneous mixture, you can filter it. So, you can filter it if it's a heterogeneous mixture. That's the first way. Letter B. If it contains something like iron with something else, iron and sand, what you can do to separate that is use a magnet. Another method uh, is well, what they do with blood. When you give blood, what they do is they separate the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets from the plasma. So how do they do that? They use a centrifuge and spin the blood. All the heavy particles like the RBCs, the WBCs, and the platelets go to the bottom, and then you have a straw-colored fluid on top, and that's called plasma. So centrifuge. Letter D, uh, maybe you did this in bio, uh, paper chromatography. Paper chromatography. Remember, that's when you like took a piece of filter paper, you cut it to make a strip, and what we did is we put India ink across, a line across it, and then dipped it in water or alcohol, and then capillary action brought the water alcohol up, and it broke it up into colors. So that's chromatography. That's D. But what I think the most important method to separate a mixture is coming up, and that's letter E, and that's called distillation. And distillation, it's usually used to separate liquids, is based on boiling points. And the biggie, the one that we use distillation for the most right now, is distillation of petroleum, separation of all the liquids in petroleum. So I'm going to draw something called a distillation tower and show you 
how distillation works for petroleum. So this is called a distillation tower. And you see them at oil refineries. So what they do is they pump the petroleum in and then they heat it up. And the liquid that has the lowest boiling point vaporizes first. And that would be methane. And then what they do is they collect the methane and then they can bring it over to another tower. And then the next one that has the next lowest boiling point would be propane. And you know propane uh, is a dense gas that you use for, char for grills. And then butane and Bic lighters and stuff like that. Notice they're getting heavier as they go down, which means the boiling points are getting higher. The next one's octane, which is gasoline. Then kerosene, a little bit heavier than gasoline. Then home heating oil or motor oil, which is really pretty heavy. And then finally, you have asphalt. Now, asphalt's the thick, black, gooey liquid. They add the crushed stone to it later on. So, this is distillation based on boiling points. And usually, the question is always answered by petroleum is what they distill the most. Remember, it's based on boiling points. And those are several ways to physically take apart mixtures.